Welcome to First Class Life, Redefining Success. I'm your host, Kate Fessler, and today my guest is Walt Disney Imagineer, Jim Henson Puppeteer, world-class artist and designer, and international speaker, Terry Harden. Welcome, Terry. Well, thank you for having me. I usually go into a bit more detail in my intros, but I think yours speaks for itself. (laughs) Before we get into your amazing career, let's step back a bit. What did you want to be when you grew up? When I grew up, I wanted to be an actress. And uh, that was, I, I, uh, I was at a small school in uh, California and I was playing in the playground. I was probably about, well, it was first grade, first grade. So what is that, six years old? And uh, unbeknownst to me, I was out on the, in the uh, area for recess. Mm-hmm. and there were a group of people off to the side, and I was calling to my friend across the grounds. And it's easily half a football field it was, and they all of a sudden looked over and said, who is this girl with this voice? Not yeah. melodic voice, big, loud, projected voice. And they came to me and they said, uh, we'd like you to we like to see if A, you can carry a tune, and B, if you can sing, because if you can sing, then we've, we've got something we'd like you to do. Because in the choir, they had tried to get kids to sing to the back of the auditorium. There mm. was a 200-person auditorium, and the kids got really quiet and wouldn't. <laughs> so they said, the song is Santa Claus is Coming to Town, and we just want you to hit that back door with your voice. And so I did, and they said... Uh, so you don't get nervous. We're going to have a lot of people saying with you. And I was like, okay, whatever. And I just belted it out and people really loved it and came up and said hello. And I realized that's that I liked it. Not so much being a singer, but being in front of people and, and performing. So that was the number one thing I wanted to do when I was a kid. I think it really hit. I was in a play, uh, Wizard of Oz and I played the Cowardly Lion And they came back and told me I I was really good. So I just said, this is what I want to do. Hmm. So not shy at all. (laughs) No, but because of my mixed, mixed background, I'm half black and I'm half white. When my mother started to audition me, they wouldn't cast me. They wanted to cast my sister who looks Hawaiian or black, depending. But I don't look like that. I'm white in skin color. I'm light in my hair color at the time, I was blonde. And they just took a look at this little kid with blonde hair sticking out all directions and white as snow and my father black and my mother, I was even lighter than my mother. They just said, no, we, we don't want that one. It looks like you did something to my oh. mom. And, dad. and I, my mom and dad were like, did something? And they go, yeah, we can't, we can't have that on TV. Now, as you know, on camera that we celebrate uniqueness, but at the time that's back in, the early 60s, they said, no, 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 we can't have that. So I had to come up with something else. I had to figure out something else because no one would touch this weird kid that just didn't look like it, was not something you could put in a box visually. Hmm. So your sister was also a performer? Not really. My sister is absolutely, and my husband will tell me that he... (laughs) doesn't really agree but (laughs) my sister was beautiful really beautiful so if you took two people and you mix them all together in my mother's stomach my sister had Farrah Fawcett type hair which was which was that white hair that kind of droops but then it had the curve from the nappiness of a black person's hair and I got all the nappiness but the blonde the color so my hair stuck out like a willow tree and my sister's cascaded down And then she had kind of that um, milk in your coffee, cream in your coffee skin. And so we would walk through restaurants. Men would look up at my sister and have an eating disorder. They would (laughs) hit themselves in the face with their fork or they would (laughs) dribble food down their shirt. And I would follow my sister and just look at them and go, don't feel bad. It happens to the best of us, you know? And that was, so I was kind of the comedy relief while my sister just walked through being being stunning. So anytime people saw her, they were like, how about her? But she tried commercials for a little while and just didn't like the toys that they asked her to play with and, and act. She didn't feel like acting. She Mm. didn't find that uh, an interesting venue. So of course Mm. that's, you know, sometimes the way it can be with people. 
So did you try again sort of uh, later in life or did you just say, well, okay, maybe I have to find a different way then? Oh, no, I have a never can quit family attitude. My father and my mother, not my, well, maybe my mom, but my dad definitely and my grandfather said, my grandfather said, a wise man, uh, my grandfather said everyone has to work for a living, a wise man plays for a living. And Mm -hmm. I loved performing. So I started to look for venues that accepted me and lo and behold, here comes the theater. So all through school I did theater roles because you know that theater roles, you can make yourself into anything and create any kind of character and still perform. Plus anyone in theater, I'm sure will tell you that the applause and the sound of a live audience is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So for me, I just said, I'm just going to keep acting and doing what I do until a door opens. I'm going to, I'm just going to give it to give it to God. Get just, relax (laughs) that word let's just chill and do what i love and keep following what i love and we'll see where it goes and then i was introduced to puppets and Mm -hmm. puppets were magical because my mother was an artist and so i was drawing early in my life i started sketching early it was a way for my mother to keep me from putting things like forks in the light socket or eating razor blades. Okay. I was a very curious kid. And my mom was just like, she's 19 with this baby. And she's like, Oh my gosh, this kid is going to put me in the hospital because she is just a nut. And I was, so this was, she found if she put paper down, I sketched and she could actually walk away for a little bit, come back and find me not into bad mischief. Mm. So for her, this is what, so these followed parallel all through my life. And then one day I took an elective in college and was introduced to puppets and art and acting came together. And I didn't have to worry about the way I looked because it was all about putting the focus on puppets. Mm. And that's how they blended. That's how it started. So which came first, the Walt Disney Imagineer or the Jim Henson Puppeteer? They both kind of came at the same time. What happened was I started early in life of creating. I am an obsessive creative. So if I saw it, I wanted to build it. And many Imagineers, if you speak with them, will say the same thing. When I was a kid, I used to take toasters apart. Or when I was a kid, I used to build ride attractions in my backyard. Or when I was a kid, for Terry, it was if I saw it and it looked cool, I wanted to do it. So at 14 years old, I did 125 gingerbread houses for my friends, decorated them all in a custom box and took them to school. My parents wow. just had, they, my mother, she said she didn't know, she, she just didn't know how to respond to this massive production that she continually told me it's too much. You should take it down, blah, blah. I just was talked to the hand and (laughs) succeeded and then did it. And then I started doing costumes and said to myself, because my mother was a seamstress, but I didn't like back then we had, uh, what was it called? It was called economics, not economic home ec. Home ec. Yeah. Yeah. Where they taught you to sew and they taught you to cook, but they taught you to sew like a vest in an A skirt. You remember those little? Yeah, I made a three-piece suit in home ec. I mean, <laughs> I, hey, I didn't do well. Mm. And I couldn't understand why I didn't do well. And then I went home and started making costumes based on playing cards and was introduced to Star Wars and started doing, started to build all these costumes, but I documented them. And all of a sudden... You know, I did it for my friends on Halloween, made them outfits. I want to be this. I want to be that. I made my sister into a telephone, all kinds of crazy stuff like that. And then, and my mom kept saying, this is great, but you know, you should think about what you want to do when you grow up. And I said, I want to be an actor. I want to be an artist. And right now I, I'm selling stuff, making a little money, drawing, I think 14, 13, 14, Eight years old, I sold my first thing, and then I just kept selling uh, anything from decorated Easter eggs to hand, hand-painted pants. When I was 14, the set, uh, I went to see Barnaby Jones, and mm-hmm. the lady there saw my work and said, would you do this on our chairs? So I was paid $35 an hour 
to illustrate all the chairs for the actors and things based on what they liked. So it just, it just kept, kept rolling until Star Wars comes out, 1977. And uh, I sneak away to see it. And it's like that scene in Jaws where the room just stretches. You just, mm. you just go back. <laughs> <laughs> and all of a sudden I saw that there were people out there that were making a living doing exactly what I did. Mm. So I knew that I could do this for a living. I didn't know how, but I knew that if I kept if I dug deeper, I would find it. And back then there were no computers, no smartphones. We were newspapers and sitting in the audience, writing down every name I could from the credits and then combing the newspapers to see if any of these people were giving talks or lectures or inviting people into their whatever so that I could, you know, crash the party and ask them, how do they do it? Mm -hmm. So you grew up in the LA area? Yes, I'm guessing. So born and raised in California. Yeah, okay. Southern California. Yes, born and raised in Pasadena. So tell me, um, what is an Imagineer? It sounds like um, it probably is a combination of sort of imagination and engineer. Yeah, that is exactly right, Kate. That's exactly right. And it's Walt's idea. Walt decides to build a park that he releases in 1955, two years before I'm born. And he gets this grand idea and he pulls these amazing collaborative artists together and he's going to build more than an amusement park. He decides to do this. Well, when he brings everybody together to create his park known as Disneyland, he wants to have a name that he calls his artists. And just like you said, these artists were going to engineer the attractions that he was going to have in this amazing new park called Disneyland. And he loved the idea of imagination, which was him, and engineer, hence Walt Disney's Imagineers. So as a kid, I'm about nine and I'm riding the Jungle Cruise over and over and over again. And the cast member there says, you know, there's a guy who's, who makes these. They, they, I don't know if you realize this, but there's a person who actually sculpts these called an Imagineer. And then they're put into the attraction to create the experience that you're, that you're witnessing. And I was like, excuse me, what? Mm. And he said, yeah, his name's Blaine Gibson. And I started to watch as many world, wonderful world of colors. I tried to dig up any kind of periodical, any magazine I could find out and found out that Blaine was their number one sculptor and found out that Blaine uh, was still there doing the work for them that he was doing. So I said, okay, how do I get myself in Blaine's chair or on Blaine's team? And uh, when I was really young, my, I auditioned for the voice of Figment, the little dragon that's in Florida. And I was, I was the top three, they flew me in and they had me audition with the voice because they said they wanted a non-actor. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, they gave it to Billy Barty, the <laughs> non-actor. Mm. But, uh, but that was a lovely experience. So I really liked the park. I really liked working with the people. So I decided to start applying and kept getting rejected and rejected and rejected. I have so many rejection letters. Wow. From this mouse. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and I would go, you little rat, you know. <laughs> so it went on for a long time. And I kept saying, you know, how do I break this wall? They say they want talented people. I know I'm good at what I do. Meanwhile, the movie industry picks me up and I'm sculpting and performing in films like Ghostbusters, Men in Black. I'm doing all these top films. I'm meeting Jim Henson. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Yet I can't get through, you know, I barely can get through the door at Disney before they punt me out again. So it's like this comedy. And I finally say, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to just, sometimes it's good for you to just set that idea down on your table and say, I'll visit that in a little while. Mm. And that's what I did. I set it down and I had a friend who had a small studio 
and he needed a sculptor to do things like McGruff the Crime Dog and Charlie Tuna for SeaWorld and uh, Smokey the Bear because they are outfits that people wear. Sorry if it's a spoiler, but they are not real. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to sculpt their heads and he was having me sculpt their heads and I was sculpting a water drop for water and power when a friend came in and just walked in to see what this, I guess he thought the studio was something he wanted to explore or who knows, got the idea, come in. And he said, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm waiting for Disney to get a clue. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, I'm keep applying to be an Imagineer and um, nothing. And he says, oh my gosh, we really need people right now. Have you applied lately? I said, yeah, about four months ago or something like that. And he says, okay, he says, uh, he says, let me take your name. And he's the one that actually got the ball running for, rolling for me that actually got me to be hired. Mm. But it was really funny. It took three months and nine interviews before they figured out I was what they wanted. And that was just crazy. Wow, that's a very high hiring bar. <laughs> it, well, I don't even know if it's a high hiring bar or the right hand doesn't know what the left is doing, you know, because I said to myself, what more do they need to know? Mm. You know, audition after audition, you know, going in and interviewing, going in and demonstrating. They needed people who worked well in floral foam. That's the foam you put your flowers in. Mm -hmm. And I was really good at it because in the movie industry, that's what we used. And they, you know, apparently the team who was waiting for me to be hired wanted me day one, but other people, and this is kind of interesting how Disney functions, other people weren't sure or something because I had to jump through hoops eight more times. And then, uh, you know how it is when you have this dream job, but you got to eat. So months are going by, you know, weeks are going by and you want to keep yourself available because you know they're going to call. Mm -hmm. But you still have to eat and you still have to figure out a way to feed yourself, pay mm -hmm. your bills. Pay your bills, yeah. But you don't want to take a job that, you know, they hire you on and then you go, hello, bye. Right. And Sorry, my dream job came through. See ya. And you're rude. Yeah. Yeah. So I was desperately trying to figure out ways to, to do something without causing um, poor effects or bad effects on another job, but still wanting to eat. When lo and behold, Dolly Parton's team calls me up and says, uh, we need a puppeteer to perform in our Christmas special. And we hear you're very good. Do you want to do that? And I said, when is it? Christmas time, around Christmas, two weeks. I said, bingo, that's the job. Yeah, perfect. That's the job because it's going to not only pay me enough that will last me, I can make that run for a little while. Um, but also, it's over the holidays. They'll never call. Well, guess who called? <laughs> <laughs> and told me I had to go in for my yet another interview. And I told him, I'm sorry, I've taken a job for two weeks. The girls got to eat. And they told me I was out of the running. And I exploded. <gasps> I just, I, on the phone, just became this crazy, angry female creature that was yelling and at them on the you guys live in fantasy land what's the matter with you how could you even function the way you guys work down there this is the most ridiculous blah 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 fine i'm out of the running i'm done with you people and i hung up and two days later they hired me <laughs> <laughs> huh <laughs> so what do we learn from this number one Get angry and they'll hire you. I said I would have done that a lot earlier if I knew that was the yeah. get free pass in there. And number and number two, um, don't always go in the front door. There, look for the back door because that's what I said. I've been knocking on the front door. I should have gone in the back. Yeah, you know. So, but when I finally got in there, everybody said, "Oh my gosh, we've been waiting for weeks for you." We have so much to do. And I was like, how is that even possible? But it was true. And I was like, okay, let's, let's, you know, let's do this thing. And we, and the first project was uh, Disneyland Paris. Oh, that's exciting. Was it was Disney's first park. 
It was going to be in Paris, France, one of my favorite cities. And uh, I got to do, the first project was Big Thunder Mountain. And in Paris, it's one of the most beautiful, if not the most beautiful, Big Thunder of all the parks because you go underneath the water. So you board on the mainland, go underneath the water and come up on an island. And then Big Thunder is all the train, the runaway mine train is all on an island. Mm. And you get to design that. You get to sit with like-minded people and design, you know, there are stages like the engineer who does the track works first and then the building around for the interior is second. And then you get to do the design of how the mountain will look third. And that's what we did. And, uh, and it was crazy. And then after that, they asked me what I wanted to do. And I had spotted a dragon and I said, I want to do the dragon. I want whatever has to do with the dragon. I want to do the dragon. So I also did the dragon retrofitted the dragon and uh, did the cavern that she, as people tell me, they said, she's a she. So I said, all right, fair enough. She sits underneath the castle in Paris. So that makes Paris the most wonderful castle because every castle should have a dragon. And Absolutely. It's fantastic. It's just, I got to do the entire attraction. So basically it is a huge monumental attraction that I did every little thing from the way she sleeps, way her eyes flutter, tail, foot, everything, breathing, all of it. And then the cavern around her are, were designed by me. And it was just a dream come true to be able to do that because I love dragons. Wow, that is very impressive and, and very uh, fitting, you know, rewarding that all of that persistence paid off in such a big way. Well, and you never know. It's like one of the things that Disney was worried about was that they could not really send, you know, you have the girl, the women that do the figure finishing on the audio animatronic figures. And this is a beautiful, uh, really challenging art because your mechanics are building the audio animatronic figure and then you've got to make clothes that don't get damaged or eaten by the way that they move the figure. So you have that to deal with, or feathers on the bird like Jose in the Tiki Room. But in the industry, they kind of think of that as women's work. Hmm. And so they had no problem sending women to figure finish figures to Paris. But a gal who slings lath and plaster, meaning a cement slinger who is female, oh, no, 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 no. We do not do that. And the reason that they weren't going to do that was because in these other countries, women were not looked upon like they were in the United States. And Disney feared, in my opinion, they feared having a woman at the helm or having a woman direct them as to what she did here in, in, uh, at Imagineering because they, didn't, they thought there was going to be a lot of overcoming and trust having to be built whereas they said the man it's already there mm. and so i said all right as much as it irks me i'm gonna tell you i'll comply if you let me pick the guy so i walked the guy through my model and showed him and talked to him about the attitude of it of the spirit of it of the feel of it and uh didn't get to see it on opening day but went in 2000 for my first viewing and it was phenomenal he had kept so many details that only I knew about that it was very exciting to walk through that knowing what I know and, and was grateful to him for being so um, true to my, my little model that I had made. Hmm. So why didn't you get to see it on opening day? That's disappointing. Well, I, you know, and again, it's they Disney would only send those who were directly involved with that portion of it. Mm. And so they flew everybody over that they were going to fly over. And I was like, okay, now I'm on another project. I'm not tied to that. I'm doing the next thing. And so, you know, the good news is that people know that it's mine, probably because I don't let them not. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, and the stuff that I know about it, and I talk about where it came from, and then, people go and see the dragon and they experience it based on some of the things. For example, the swishing tail that's in the water comes from a cat where the paw while the dragon is dreaming comes from my dog. I saw a dog dreaming and how they chase 
rabbits mm-hmm. in their sleep. And so I made the dragon while sleeping, smoke tendrils come up as the dragon's dreaming and then the paw shakes as if she's in somewhere in her dreams. Mm-hmm. Then when she wakes up, I sculpted the floor in which you stand just slightly below where her head rests. So when she raises up to look at you, she's over your head. So your whole body has to pull back Mm. to look up. And that's because I want that impact. I want you to have that feeling of how large she really is and how now it's a decision whether or not she's hungry or she's not. (laughs) (laughs) And hopefully not. Hopefully not. All of this went into this, the puppetry helped, the acting helped, because I had to pitch this to my superiors, my show producers who ran the park. And I, I was a lady, so this was something that I didn't think was a problem. I didn't look at it as like, oh, rats, I'm a girl. I basically just, coming from the movie industry, that's what it's all about. It's, a, it's an old boy, especially in the, in the, the I'm trying to think of what it, you're, you're more in the crew kind of heavy mm-hmm. lifting. Right. And I, yeah. You know, and so there's a, lo- a lot more men when you're sculpting, there's just a ratio. Maybe you've got three women and the rest of them are men in the film industry doing what you do. That's really, you can decide whether that's a problem for you or it's not. If I walk around saying to myself, Oh, I got to prove myself again. Oh gosh, it's, I don't know. I wish people would just take me on. Blah blah blah. That attitude can be very detrimental and lose time. So mm-hmm. I basically just say I go in there saying, in the first two hours, I'm going to blow the doors off this place, and then people will be quiet. So, for example, I did sculpting for a parade. Uh, it was a parade for Disney, and. They had to do, I had to sculpt a female Godzilla that was eight feet tall and about six feet deep, six feet wide. I had two weeks. And so I brought my chainsaw and I said, where do I go? And of course you walk in, first of all, you'll notice that I don't look like everybody else. (laughs) So that makes people look. And then uh, at this little shop, they said it's back there. So I just fired up the chainsaw, used the machete, and just for the first, I think my first day, it was just this flurry of foam flying and arms flying and hair flying. And when it was done, it was roughed out in about eight to 10 hours. And when I turned, there were people watching because I was kind of this enigma. And they wanted to see, will the enigma work? And of course, when the dust fell down, they were like, oh my God, yeah, it's fine, whatever. So that's kind of what you have to do. I think a lot of women will say, you've always had to be more than just good. You had to be great. Right. But okay, that makes me stretch. And so every day I want to be great no matter what sex I am. So I didn't take it as offensive. I just said, this is what I have to do. I want to do this. I have to stretch. And so that I just, you know, head down, butt up, they say, and went for it because this meant a lot to me to do this stuff. And I love every minute of doing it. And I still do. Yeah, well, that's very exciting. Mm -hmm. So tell me about Jim Henson. So you actually, you said you met Jim Henson. Yes. So you must have worked with him before he passed. Yes. Tell me about that experience. Well, okay. So builder, 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 see it, want to build it. That's an objective, uh, obsessive creative. And so now I'm into the puppet world. And when I'm about 18, 17, 18 years old, eight, yeah, 17, 18 years old, I'm invited to audition for a new show called BB Beagle for Hanna-Barbera. A friend of mine who's an animator there, Philo Barnhart, he he was animating there and he hears about this and he goes, oh my gosh, I've got this girl who is this puppet crazy girl. She does the voices. She does this. She does that. I would love for her to audition for this TV show. So the fellow says, well, yeah, have her come in, have her bring her puppets too. So I did. And it was very early and the guy just looked at everything. And he's like, oh my gosh, you have all these puppets. You have all this stuff. You're doing all these voices. I I can't give you the job yet, but I definitely can tell you on the roster for the audition, but we may have a school 
blah, blah, blah. So long story short, I auditioned for this little thing. And I think they're going to have four people go up. And I find out after I audition that there's only one space available. Mm. And uh, I'm sitting in the waiting room and there are people coming into audition who have a bunch of puppets of their own, who talked about shows that they did on the road. And I'm someone who is in my garage building and performing at my church. So no big shows, no big credits, just me. And if this has ever happened to you, the voice in your head will start to say, maybe you should run. Hmm. Maybe you should just get out. These people are too, they've got a lot of big guns and you're just a little gun. You know, maybe you should just go. But then another voice comes in and says, if you do, you've lost. Mm -hmm. Why not stay? You know, and I just pretended to read some magazine and when my name was called, I went in and uh, I just forgot everything around me and did what I do. And uh, they decided to hire me. And later I found out they were only hiring one. And they said, you were the one we wanted. And I was just besides myself. So I was introduced to all of these amazing people. And one of the schools we had was a school that... Um, Sid and Marty Croft put on where they auditioned a bunch of puppeteers, three women only out of 30 students, three women. But we did voices with June Foray and we got to act with Harvey Limbeck and we got uh, to be taught how to do puppetry with Tony Urbano, who at, at the time, and I believe still is one of the West coast premier puppeteers. So working with him, got me a job in his studio sculpting chicken McNuggets. <laughs> so if you go way back to the time when chip, chicken McNuggets were not computer generated, but they were little puppets that we operated on miniature sets and I built them. Mm. So all of a sudden I, my, my uh, mentor, you might say, or, or the puppeteer who was hiring me, Tony, said, uh, Terry, I need you to go to New York because we're going to shoot a commercial in New York. And we did. We shot this commercial in New York. And while in New York, I asked to meet Jim Henson. I said, can we go to Ha? We got a day free. I need to go to Ha. And, and Tony said, well, I don't know if you can meet Jim. I don't, I don't, I don't think you'll be able to meet Jim. And I said, you know what? It's going to sound weird. I don't need to meet Jim. I need to know, I need to go into where they build the puppets because I don't know how they, how they finish Miss Piggy. I don't know how they fi finish Bunsen. It's not cloth like Kermit. It's different. What is that? And that's where I wanted to go. And when we came in, Jim was there and Jim automatically spied me and walked over to me because there were so few women in puppetry at that time. He wanted to know all about me. What are you doing here? You're with one of the top people, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and gave me his number and said, call me. And so when I got home, I called him up and just left my name and number. And the woman says, yeah, if he's interested, he'll call you. So he called me back and he asked me if I wanted to fly to New York and stay there for a while and work for Sesame Street. And I said, no, no, no. And everybody goes, oh, what? But <laughs> But I hated Manhattan. No offense, Manhattan, but it was so noisy. It was so disruptive. I came home and must have slept for like a full day because I just couldn't rest. There was methane coming up from the ground and it was just an experience I wasn't loving. So I said to him, I said, uh, I'm sorry, Jim, but I can't live there. And he said, well, what makes you think you can work for me if you don't live here? And I said, oh, oh, well, you have Dave Goals who plays Gonzo. He lives up north in California. And then you have Kevin Clash who does a multitude of things. He lives in Atlanta. He lives in Baltimore. And then you have Steve Whitmire. He lives in Atlantic City. And Jim Henson goes, someone has been doing their homework. And I said, <laughs> yes. So if you ever need someone from California, I'd love to work with you and your team. I just, I just know I can do my best performance. And in, that was 82. And in 89, he said he was coming for me. 
and that I better be good because if I didn't audition well, he was going to make, he was going to make great fun out of me. He was going to make me his, uh, his mule, so to speak. <laughs> and I said, bring it on pal. And, uh, and it was fantastic. I auditioned and, uh, we did Muppet 3D Theater first, which was his first uh, thing he did for Disney. And I performed that and worked with him on that. Meanwhile, called back into Imagineering to sculpt Big Thunder Tokyo. Oh. And so I was sculpting Big Th Thunder Tokyo by night while performing three Muppet 3D Theater by day, which is something that people don't do. So what does this tell you? Well, people told me that if you got a job from Disney, you got pigeonholed and that they didn't pay you. And I always ask, and I'll ask it now, why do you buy this book? Just because someone tells you this is what is the truth, why do you believe it? Mm -hmm. You know, why? I mean, even if you read it somewhere, why do you believe it? We don't know who this person was that says this. We don't know what their circumstances were. So I walked in and said, this is the door opening. Other opportunities will happen. And they did. I went from the rock work division, which was sculpting mountains and rocks and all of the scenery that you see, to going to the sculpture room. But I also did Foley work. I did voiceover work. I went over to the studio and worked on Muppet 3D Theater. I sculpted for Disney, I sculpted for Disney Animation. And it was just because I kept looking and then showing and then introducing and talking and just being friendly. And was it difficult? Yeah, but how bad do you want it? Mm -hmm. You know, this is not a silver platter job. This is a job where you're constantly not having to prove yourself, but if you want to get somewhere, you have to be a little hunter and kind of figure out where you can go and what you can do to maybe find that opportunity. Right. Well, I think it's important for everyone to sort of take charge of their own career and look out for themselves rather than just, you know, oh, the company needs to do this for me, right? And it sounds like you are someone who just can't stop. So I can understand how you were always looking for like the next thing to do. And Jim was a great guy. And I also got to meet Frank Oz, who was someone that just sent me over the moon. I thought Frank Oz was just, a, I thought they were both amazing. But to get to meet both of them and to get to speak with both of them. And I think if you share your heart, it, I, I remember um, being told by James Malinchek, who does a speaker uh, workshop, uh, big speaker workshop. And he may not necessarily do for you what he says he's going to do, but he still does some things for you that you're not expecting. And the one thing he said that really resonates with me is to put a towel over your arm, put a, a, a napkin over your arm and ask, how may I help you before you ask how you can be helped? Mm -hmm. And boy, that has really served me well. I don't consciously do it. I just analyze that that seems to be what I do. So how can I help you first? And then I could sure use this. And I don't even think about what I can do, but the return person says, what can I, what can I help you with? Mm -hmm. So I shared my heart with Jim, just basically told him how much I love the Muppets and what particular shows and what particular characters and how I had come there to learn about, I'm a builder. So I wanted to learn, you know, would you mind sharing with me how Miss Piggy is done? I don't understand how she's covered. And he was like, oh my gosh, that's what you want to know? And I said, yeah, it's, you know, instead of I want a job, I want to be a puppeteer, blah, blah, blah. I just said, I just, I, I build puppets and I can't figure this out. And he loved showing it to me. And it turns out it's a form of um, um, what they call uh, flocking, which is they use static electricity and glue and this electrical hand wand, and it has bits of felt all chopped up, and they actually adhere to the puppet's head on end, and it just covers it. Like, it's, it's, it's fantastic. It's so amazing. 
but another artist is going to want to show you that. And then all of a sudden he said, do you think you're going to do it? And I said, no, but I sure do like, to <laughs> I like learning about it. I don't know if I'll ever do it, but wow, that is cool. You yeah. know? So I think if you sell it, share your heart with someone and, uh, and you just kind of, it, it, they can't help, but want to, you know, have a conversation, you know? So, yeah. I think that's what did it. Plus being a woman, which really surprised him because at the time women, there's more women puppeteers now than there were before, but we're under the floor nine times out of 10 and we're inside couches Mm -hmm. and we're in the trunks of cars. So makeup doesn't really, it's not a good idea to have a lot of makeup on because all that dust and dirt sticks to your, your face and stuff. So they, a lot of women weren't interested in it at the time, but now a lot, you know, things are different and things are shifting and more and more females are getting in and, and doing it. And it's no longer, I mean, if it is practical, that's more rare than, than normal now. Back in my day, everything was practical. We built the puppets and we performed the puppets. We built the sets. We did everything. And now it's a green room and a green screen and it's built in the computer, a lot of it. Yeah. So it's not that this is bad. It's just that it's different. So we've had to now sculpt our careers. Now, what do we do as artists sit in the corner and get angry at CG or say, what's next for me? What, Mm -hmm. how do I reapply this technique so that I can eat? Yep. Adapt and survive as I believe was a Starbucks slogan a long time ago. (laughs) (laughs) A good one. Yeah. A very good one. Um, So what are you doing now? Well, right now, there's so many things swirling around if we're talking about at this very moment. But what happened was I was working at a studio and I decided that when I was about, what was I? I decided by the time I was 50, I wanted to work from home or work on my terms, which meant I'm no longer a work for hire. I want to be... Uh, I want to, I don't mind being work for hire, but I want it to be my terms. Mm -hmm. So I worked very hard to create a business, which I call Terry Harden Designs. And I create prototypes. I create small, um, small miniature sculptures like this one here, which is, uh, yeah, this one was done for Disney back in 1998. And this is an art proof of it. And then um, I had a client who does watches and he needed a box sculpted. So this whole box is done in like a bas relief, all of the little designs on it that you can see in there. Wow. And then that's all done by hand. And that was crazy, man, doing that. But that kind of thing. And then also uh, I do one of a kinds for collectors. So I'll do a line of work. Maybe it's 50 to 100 limited edition small sculptures and a, a collector can buy them. They can actually um, come and purchase them from me or they can commission a one of a kind. So we will talk about the size you need, what it's going to be, the price, understand it's one of a kind. But that way, if you're someone who's always dreamed of having a something mm. and people don't seem to be making it that you can come to me and do it. And, uh, my dream job is I'm creating a line of handbags that I've hand sculpted and created. And I want to do one of a kinds for people smash the mold and then put the mold in, um, put the mold encase the mold. And then you get that as your, it's one, it's yours never to be oh. done. again. Wow. Great thing. And then that way, if you want something that's exclusively you, you can have that. But I also speak all over the world. And this year I have been speaking like a crazy woman. Last year, I think maybe I had three or four speaking gear, gear, gigs all year. This year uh, it's exploded. I've already had 10 and it's barely what March. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's been great. And not all of them have been uh, super big pay but a lot of them have. So it's just a way for me to gauge, okay, it's getting better. Now, um, for those who go to my website, they'll be like, the website doesn't have an about me page. The website doesn't have a speaker reel. And yet I'm landing these opportunities. 
doesn't mean that I'm not going to have those things, but I haven't been able to put them together because they've been happening so quickly. Mm -hmm. So the goal is to get a speaker reel up and about me page up so that when people go to the website, they're not scratching their head as to what's going on with this girl. But I always tell people to Google me because that's the easiest way to do it. And that I have a Wikipedia page, which people say is a big deal. Okay. I have one. That is a big deal. So <laughs> I have one and thank you whoever did it. Um, but so that way, if a person wants to learn like you did, you, you did some research because I was not accessible and I apologize for that. But that way people can go pull stuff off the internet and it's stuff it's it, because there's so much. One person I remember way back when said, have you ever Googled yourself? And I said, no. And they said, try it. And things just kept going up. And what, who is this person? You know, that's done all this stuff. And you say to yourself, wow. You start to think about, oh yeah, I did that. Oh my goodness. You know, and, and uh, it's, it's quite amazing because I, the about me page has been a challenge, Kate, because I said to myself, who would believe this? You know, <laughs> <laughs> who's going to believe this woman did all this? And then I had a friend say, who cares? It's the about me page. Get it? Just yeah. Get it. don't worry about stuff like that. And I said, you're right. You know, you, you know, it's the obvious that'll get you. It is the about me page. So I will try to put it concise so people don't read a novel. And then at the end, I'll say, for more information, Google me. Right. <laughs> Go to Wikipedia. <laughs> Save yourself. Google me. Um, but yeah, there's been a lot of opportunities that have crossed and, and a lot has happened and a lot is happening. And, and this very moment, I'm, I'm about to go up to Edmonton in a week and a half. And uh, T, I, I'm going, I, the goal is to go up and take a class but I've actually been asked to uh, share my knowledge as well. So it's a uh, few days turned into a week and uh, I'm very excited to, to go up there and experience uh, not only this new found way of art, but to share mine with, with people because I speak, I have a thing called cash in your passion. So cash in your passion means how to make a living doing what you love, if that is a, mostly schools, that's what I talk about. And then in businesses, it's just to show you how innovation and creativity can set you above the rest. And I'll, you know, I'll just get ready to have a retreat in July. I'm putting it together now where me and 10, yeah, me and 10 women will sit down at a retreat, have wine, have cheese, relax, sleep, swim, all that kind of stuff, but also get down on their businesses or their art and talk specifically about what they need and they want. And we'll work on it together like a mini mastermind. But that's what I'm going to do. It's going to be my first because I realized I'm not, I love speaking it to a big audience, but when it comes to instruction, I'm very hands on. Mm -hmm. So I don't want it more than 20 people. Right. So my coaches have said, why don't you start with 10 and see how you like it? So and, and, it, and you know it's right because you get excited about it yourself. Mm -hmm. you know? So I had somebody say, why don't you do an event where there's 100 people? And I kept going, yeah. And then I was not excited about it. And then I changed my mind and I said, well, what if it's just 10 people? And yeah. everybody, and I said, oh, I love that idea. The idea of getting together and just um, getting to know each other and, and what do you need and how do you need it? And let's talk specifically about about that yeah, so that's the beautiful thing is you get to choose right you get to choose what's right yeah. for you yeah, who, which one is gonna fit they'll have to you know let me know and the same with paris i had a paris trip scheduled for last year and people had to postpone for whatever reason and so now it's for this september i've got three people signed up and i can only take three more and it to is disneyland in paris yes we're going to disneyland in paris for two days which I'll pretty much, I'll schedule, I'll do your entrance in, and then I will probably plan a lunch on each day or a dinner on one and a lunch on the other, and then leave you to do whatever you want, but we'll all do it together. I won't structure it. If you want to go out and go shopping, fine, whatever. But if you want me to talk about my attractions and stuff, 
walk through Disneyland and show you a couple of things that I can share, definitely we will do that. But then the other three days are in Paris. And it's not going to be the classic touristy stuff that people go to Paris to see. We're going to do some stuff that I do. I've been there. It will be my sixth time there. And I want to show you what I do, which has nothing to do with a lot of the places that people do. However, we will drive by and show you where those places are if you've never been. So you can either add it, you can add it to the end and then do some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. But I want to do, I like to do, things that tourists don't think of doing and I've done it for the last two years I've gone and it's just amazing like making baguette and croissant with somebody who doesn't speak English mm. and um, that's fantastic or a walking tour and learning about these green fountains that look like beautiful green fountains but turn out to be places for you to fill your water bottle right. mm -hmm. this is the French you know so this is what it's about. And we're going to do all kinds of cool VIP type stuff. One of the things that we're going to do is uh, eat at the Jules Verne restaurant in the Eiffel Tower. Mm. The one touristy thing I want to do, but people haven't done it. Right. And it's one I want to do almost every time I go because it's an experience not to be missed. So we'll probably take a private boat down the Sin. So we'll have a river cruise down that river and then we'll end near the Eiffel Tower and we'll get off and we'll go to dinner mm -hmm. and then that will be our evening. So that's the idea of the whole trip is to have this uh, super califragilistic time with six people. And that way you'll get the VIP treatment you deserve and, uh, and I can do it. And then I can see if I like it, this is going to be my first one and I've told people, you may find that I'm going to charge more next time. So get it while it's while Get it's, it while it's hot. Yeah. So yeah. how can people do that? Tell me, tell me quick. Well, <laughs> all you have to do is uh, email me at terry at terryharden.com. So T-E-R-R-I at T-E-R-R-I-H-A-R-D-I-N.com or Google me. You can find my phone number, you can find my website, you can find my Facebook page, all that stuff there, rather than me stating, you know, facebook.com slash Terry Harden, which is my page and all that kind of stuff. Just, just, you can also go to my website, sign up. But if you don't want to do that, just email me because that's the best way to find out about it or met or find me, look me up on Facebook and message me, you know, but uh, I have, you know, you're the first person that I've actually told in public about it. I haven't even, I announced it, I think a little bit on Facebook and I have a lady who says she's interested, but, uh, and I've told people, you know, because it's six people, it's not a buck 98. So mm -hmm. don't, don't, you know, freak out, but understand this is something where you're going to have me take care of you for five days. And, uh, and you know, that personal touch is, is a different experience. So if you want it, great. Just think of it as Adventures by Disney, except for it's not going to be 30 people. It's going to be six. Mm -hmm. So, Well, Terry, uh, we are almost out of time. I, am, I have so yeah, much more I want to talk to you about. I might have to have you back again. So we I would love have that. Conversation. But thank you so much, Terry Harden, uh, Disney Imagineer. Jim Henson, puppeteer, world-class artist and designer and international speaker and taking people to Paris in the fall. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. This was great fun.